one to the Canadian Nurses Association's webinar series, Progress and Practice. This webinar is entitled Opioid Overdose Prevention Basics for Nurses. This session is being recorded for nurses who are unable to participate today. My name is Carrie Schuhendler, and I'm a registered nurse and policy advisor at the Canadian Nurses Association, and I will be hosting the webinar. At the end of this presentation, we will answer your questions, which you can type in the Q&A box that you see to the right of the slide. We will address as many questions as time allows. After the webinar, we will email you a link to the recording and a short evaluation. Once you've submitted your feedback, you'll be redirected to the Certificate of Participation. And now a little bit about our presenters, Megan Dumas and Coco Culbertson. Megan is a registered nurse and part-time senior practice leader at the BC Center for Disease Control, where she started her career as a street nurse and has moved into policy and leadership roles concerning overdoses and HIV AIDS. She is currently working on her PhD as a joint Trudeau Scholar at the University of Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Intervention and the University of British Columbia School of Nursing. Coco has been an anti-poverty activist and harm reduction leader in Vancouver's downtown east side community since 2000. Her work with the PHS Community Service Society has been focused on peer and community development. Coco has been in senior management with the society for over a decade and has been at the forefront of program development and reducing barriers for community members to access housing, employment, and health care. Today's webinar, Opioid Overdose Prevention Basics for Nurses, is the first in a five-part series on substance use trends in Canada, what nurses need to know. The other, the other Webinars are as follows and are available uh, for registration on CNA's website. Now over to our presenters. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Megan Chuma. And I'm Coco Culbertson. Good morning. Or good afternoon. So today we're going to go over some background on the, what's happening with overdose in Canada. I'm also going to um, introduce the concept of harm reduction, hopefully familiar to some of you. Um, we're going to go over uh, overdose response and naloxone and then uh, focus on how you can implement um, overdose prevention strategies into your clinical practice and um, your own clinic or hospital. And hopefully I have lots of time for questions. Opioid overdose has a high mortality, can be reversed by overdose management and naloxone administration. Comprehensive overdose intervention programs empower communities and clinicians to save lives. Great. Um, thanks, Coco. So just talking a bit about what's the burden of disease of overdose in Canada. Um, so <clears throat> the answer is we don't really know. Um, unfortunately, we don't have great statistics and that we're getting real time from most of our provinces. Uh, Kai Hai did an excellent report that came out quite recently um, but really looking at the data in hospitals. And they tell us that the number of admissions to Canadian hospitals for opioid poisoning has increased by 42% from 2007 to 2015, so almost doubled. Um, we know that prescription drug overdoses account for 30 to 50 percent of drug-related deaths, um, and that's a 2009 stat, so I'd expect it to be higher now. And we also uh, know that the annual overdose rate in people who inject drugs is between 1 to 3 percent per year in BC. Some recent um, research has found that number to be closer to 5 percent. And this is a, um, just an image from the Kaihai report I referenced earlier looking at the uh, age-adjusted rate of hospitalization due to opioid poisoning per 100,000 population by province. And you can see the rate's about 13.4 um, in Canada in all. That's an increase of sort of three um, in terms of an absolute rate difference. But the next slide really shows us um, the hospitalization rate um, across the different provinces. And you can see that Saskatchewan is um, one of the, the worst case scenarios along with BC and Alberta and the territories. Um, and then you can see the, uh, the rate in Canada just under 13 there. Um, but before I get too far into epidemiology and numbers, I always like to um, remind ourselves that these are not about uh, numbers. These are people. These are brothers and sisters, children, loved ones, colleagues. Um, this slide is an image of 
our friend and colleague Dean Wilson from the and Dean was the founder of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. And these are a number of crosses um, that him and colleagues from DHS Community Services and a number of activist organizations brought to City Hall in Vancouver. And, and each cross represents the life of a loved one that died. And this was a, a really important turning point in the activism for supervised injection sites in Vancouver um, before the founding of Insight and really galvanized sort of public support and opinion um, for supervised injection sites. Uh, unfortunately, and this is an old picture, really, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, Coco and colleagues and I were all um, uh, doing a similar action for National Overdose Week um, where we had 922 feathers representing the 922 folks in D.C. who died in the last year. And it's, it's really a staggering number. Um, um, and these are you know, mothers, um, some of my clients that I've worked with as a, as a street nurse at Chiwe with, um, and some of the children that I've worked with have lost both their parents or are now orphans. So just a profound um, impact on our community. So we hope that today's presentation can really um, help stop that overdose, this overdose crisis. Um, moving back to the boring numbers, just to put it in context for BC, you see just this dramatic increase um, now at, at the 922 mark of overdose deaths. It's gotten so bad here that our um, provincial health officer, and uh, that's Dr. Perry Kendall, along with Mr. Terry Lake, our Minister of Health, um, and here we see we've declared a, a public health emergency. And so uh, we're hope hopefully all hands on deck in British Columbia, but um, I mentioned uh, that we have 922 uh, deaths, but that doesn't, these stats don't also capture the huge amount of uh, reversible, reversed overdoses we have that might have brain damage. Um, and so we're, we're really sort of struggling here in British Columbia. We know that this is moving across the country. Um, now I, I want to talk about what can we do about it, get, getting out of the numbers. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm getting a note to speak up. Sorry, we should have said Coco and I have terrible colds. <laughs> we have literally a box of tissues in front of us. Um, maybe Leah can tell me if that's loud enough. We're trying not to share our, our, uh, our cold voices, but maybe we're speaking too quietly. Uh, so getting it back into what can we do, um, harm reduction and, and engagement. So we really find in our work that harm reduction is a philosophy where we, we focus on um, not judging people, accepting them where they're at, and walking with them in their journey. Um, we uh, define harm reduction as an opportunity for engagement. Um, it targets marginalized populations who aren't engaged with the healthcare system and who maybe aren't interested in addictions treatment at the moment, but it, it gives them a practical way to stay, to stay safe. Examples could be needle and syringe exchange, so preventing blood-borne infections by providing clean needles. Um, it can be uh, intervening on overdoses. In terms of uh, linking to health services, harm reduction is really a strategy that can help foster trust and build relationships. And it's often presented in, as, a, as an opposite to treatment or to addictions treatment, and that's not how uh, we see it or how it's defined in literature. It's really part of a continuum, and harm reduction can be used to really engage folks in treatment, and I see that in my uh, clinical practice all the time. But some of the principles of harm reduction are listed here. So we've got pragmatism. That's about recognizing that um, drugs have been in society for a long time and that um, it's really the social context and criminalization that make it uh, an issue. It's about recognizing human rights as central to uh, and people's dignity and the rights of drug users, respecting their autonomy. It focuses on immediate harms. So we, we know that, um, you know, Preserving life is most important. So in the example of supervised consumption sites, really their main reason for um, existing is to prevent overdose deaths. And after that, we sort of have a hierarchy of interventions we use, such as um, preventing HIV and Hep C. We engage people in primary care, do wound care, um, a variety of interventions, but just focusing on the, on this immediate uh, loss of life. One of, one of the quotes we often say is, you know, you can't help someone who's passed away. And so it's, it's really about being pragmatic and realistic and, and protect, preserving life at all costs. 
Um, we maximize intervention options, so that really recognizes that people with um, substance use issues benefit from a variety of different approaches, and there's no one size fits all. That can mean um, for some people an AA model might work really well, for others smart programs, for others um, a heroin-assisted treatment program. Um, we prioritize immediate goals in like clinical practice. I, I might have a, a to-do list when I'm engaging in outreach with a client around um, perhaps our antiretroviral therapy or getting to a suppressed viral load. But when I meet with them, I always start with, you know, what brought you in today <laughs> and how can I help you? And, and often that's a, a sandwich or they need a safe place to sleep that night. So really um, recognizing their, their immediate goals. And then um, finally, the invol meaningful involvement of people who use drugs and drug user involvement in your programming, and that's, that's really critical to the harm reduction philosophy. I'm going to hand it now over to uh, Coco, who is going to talk about how you action some of these principles. I'm going to mute. Hi, everyone. So the PHS Community Services Society is a not-for-profit uh, operating in the downtown east side, and we've been around about 24 years at this point. The primary focus um, of our service is to capture people that have been lost elsewhere, folks that nobody would house or nobody would connect with because their behavior was too challenging, um, they were too, um, you know, non-compliant or, you know, chronically homeless, um, you know, struggling with mental illness and um, addiction disorders and behavioral stuff. And that's really our target population. Um, so as service providers, the responsibility to adhere to and innovate harm reduction principles and methodologies is ever present. Reducing the harm caused by structural violence of poverty and policies that put people at risk, people that are dependent on illicit substances, be it heroin or crack cocaine, crystal meth, or isopropanol if they're drinkers, um, that's the core of our mandate at the PHS. We do this by remaining engaged, meaningfully engaged, um, with the people we serve, and it's far more complicated than it sounds. Um, we do this through building relationships, and a huge part of what we do is support staff, supporting our staff and the management to approach all their interactions with a trauma-informed lens and by robust and regular in-services and training is a huge piece of what we do, constantly leading with radical kindness and trying to foster the health of our employees so they can come to work and deal with really challenging situations over and over again with a full heart, ready to do the work, and ready to do some heavy lifting is a, is a huge, huge piece. Um, you know, we support the staff in their personal involvement when addressing their biases and their emotional discomforts when dealing with a challenging behavior. Sometimes we have folks that come in day in and day out and tell us to, you know, go F ourselves. And our job is to be big enough to take that and continue to do the work and to keep our, our lens on the bigger picture, on building trust and building relationships, never putting the onus on the person coming in, the client. The onus is always on the service provider. Harm reduction. The PHS, we employ harm reduction strategies across all of our housing and services. However, some of the programs listed here were developed for specific needs articulated by the community we serve in the downtown east side. And when I say articulated, I mean articulated loudly through activism and um, anger and outrage at the loss of life, at the high rates of zero conversion to HIV, for lack of clean needle supplies, all of those things. We were beholden to that movement to do something bigger and to, to change management, to do things differently. Today, the services listed on this slide, they all operate beyond their mandate. Insight, for example, which has been in operation about 13, almost 14 years now, um, is seeing between 600 and 800 um, supervised injections a day. So the model there is five PHS mental health workers that have longstanding community relationships with folks in the communities, two nurses and a clinical case coordinator that oversees the nurses, and they work together um, as a co-managed project, so it's very interdisciplinary and very seamless in their approach. And then we also employ people with lived experience. So we have two people working that are peers that have used Insight at one point or been at risk of overdose themselves. And together they work as a team to provide a service that's welcoming for the most challenging behaviors, provides clinical oversight and intervention when needed, some basic wound care, some referral 
to opiate agonist treatment and referral to on-site, which is also listed on the slide. That on-site lives right above Insight and is a pre-tox, uh, detox, and recovery program for folks that are intravenous drug users that access services at Insight. Our needle exchange, um, which is a distribution and recovery program, we have both a mobile and a fixed window. Between those two sites, we distribute well over 2 million um, syringes annually. We recover probably just under uh, 1.9 million. Um, this program ha has really made a massive impact on the community it serves. Back in the day when we did one-for-one uh, -one exchanges, clean needles had an economic value on the street because there was a limited supply. So drug dealers and users would sell them, and you know everyone's very poor, so often they'd share needles when they didn't have enough money to buy a needle, and if they didn't have a needle to return, they couldn't get one in exchange. So we approached this basically with the basic economics. If we flood the market and eradicate the monetary value of a clean needle, people will never share or use dirty rigs, and people won't have to buy them. Um, and it's had an enormous impact on seroconversion rates and on the wellness and health of our community. Okay, next one. Sorry. Thanks. <clears throat> our approach to care. Um, you know, we truly meet people where they are at. Um, and again, like that is as complicated as it can be. It requires us to constantly lead with radical kindness, kindness um, and to carefully monitor ourselves for assigning our own expectations of recovery or health or wellness or employment on the clients we serve. Um, we focus on building relationships and trust. And this sometimes takes months or weeks or years or days, but our job is to have con continuity and stability in our approach. And that allows us to have opportunities. That's where the door is open. If you're consistent in your practice and you adhere with great fidelity to a trauma-informed approach and, again, to radical kindness, then that's when the doors start to open. And that's when you can actually intervene and have an, a meaningful engagement with people. Um, and again, it, man, it, it's easy to burn out and move off of that pretty quickly. But, our job as leaders is to give our teams the support they need to be able to adhere to those um, principles of care. People, not pathology. This is one of my favorites. One of the most important things um, I can share is to see people holistically and not as the illness or addiction or whatever they present with, not as someone who's septic or someone who has some sort of myelitis, but to engage with them as a human in the moment, as a whole person. Stigma continues to keep drug consumers in the margins. It's a common enemy of both drug users and nurses and people like me and the entire, our entire society. Um, you know, agencies and professionals, we, could, we need to strive to provide harm reduction and housing and primary care and many other services by practicing the removal of stigma. Um, as long as we keep people in the margins, they're going to continue to overdose alone in their rooms or in their hotels or in basements where no one finds them, and we'll never be able to get them out into the public where they can be supported and used safely. So providing humane and dignified access to care and harm reduction is essential in work, in this work. Oh, the importance of belonging. You know, creating opportunities, meaningful opportunities for marginalized people accessing care improves both individual and community health outcomes. We've experienced this, and time and time again, providing opportunities for involvement has proven to reduce harm. Many of the services that we provide at the PHS, um, and in partnership with the, our local health authority, Vancouver Coastal Health, um, are run by peers, so individuals with lived experience, many of them drug consumers, many of them living in abject poverty, and many of them having regular interaction with the justice system at one time or another, all of them being at risk of overdose themselves. And at one time, all of them, I mean, recently, most of the people we support and work with on the street have lost not just one, but multiple members of their community or direct, direct family. By engaging users in the service we provide, not only do we leverage their expertise, which is unbelievably valuable, I cannot underscore that enough, their presence lends our service credibility among drug user communities. So the drug users see faces they recognize and um, are more trusting, uh, you know, because they've been often, they've been treated terrible by medical institutions and by the systems in place. And having drug users at the forefront of your service will open doors so that you can engage in ways you never thought possible. 
Um, you know, the other thing is they keep us on the cutting edge of any emerging crisis. Um, they know what's on the street. They know what drugs are being used. They know, and they, they inform us. And, like, we are always being informed as what we need to do next by our frontline peer lived experience workers. Um, you know, and reciprocally, we have found these positions, and peer, these peer positions, um, have eased poverty for these folks, often offer stability. Um, their use of, you know, their drug use lowers. They come to work more consistently over time. Um, there's a feeling of connectedness and therapeutic family. Um, there's a dignity for them to be able to engage um, in a meaningful work that isn't something that is seen by society as crime or nuisance or petty, petty theft. Um, so in, in turn, that lowers their, their rates of recidivism, which is better overall, again, um, community-wise for our health. Housing first. Well, I can't speak enough about, um, you know, if you are serving folks that are not housed, it is going to be a battle um, that is just unwinnable. People need a place where they can exist without being judged and hounded and harassed. These are people who are frequently viewed as liabilities, blamed for crime and social ills, and seen as a waste of time and energy. They are regarded harshly, even by the people who make compassion in their careers. So that is a beautiful quote by Liz Evans in uh, Gabor Mate's book, The Realm of Hung Hungry Ghosts, which I recommend everyone reads. Um, and it's just, if we cannot have decent, dignified, safe housing for people, I don't know um, how we can intervene with any positive outcomes. We need to be housing the folks and advocating for their housing as nurses, as service providers, as physicians, everyone. Culture saves lives. So there's a movement in the downtown east side um, led by Patrick Smith, who is the Aboriginal Services Director at the PHS. And it's, it's not a program. Um, it's not a place. It's a movement. And it offers culture as medicine. Um, approximately 70% of the population uh, the PHS serves in the downtown east side are indigenous. And having this movement embedded in every aspect of service delivery and inform us how to serve people in a culturally safe way keeps us, um, you know, improving our services. Um, Culture Saves Lives is it's powwow, it's feast, it's sweats, it's drum circles, um, and it's very much alive. And it's been one of the biggest, um, I think, improvements that we've felt um, as a community in the last several years. Uh, I cannot speak enough. To all, we have all sorts of language and theoretical context around cultural safety, um, but it doesn't do anything for us in our practice if it lies in a binder on the side of your desk. Actually getting involved and learning and challenging your beliefs and opening the door um, to these sort of movements and practices, again, will greatly, um, we've found anyways, has greatly improved the health and well-being holistically of the community of the downtown east side and the indigenous people and non-indigenous people that benefit from these programs. Thank you. This is the overdose prevention site called the Maple Overdose Prevention Site. After Minister Terry Lake um, declared a provincial health emergency, we were allowed to open very low barrier, peer run, sort of lifeguard stations, if you will, of overdose prevention sites. These are really ad hoc. Um, this site, I got the news on December 7th at 5 o'clock that we were allowed to do this, and I was open by noon the next day. Um, these sites are run by one PHS mental health worker and two lived experience peers with enormous amount of support from some very strong leaders in nursing in the downtown east side through the local health authority and BCCDC. Um, we have nursing, nurses come in and teach ongoing, like once a week they come in and continue to work with the peers on improving their understanding of um, opioid overdose response, what it looks like. We have working groups about how some of the overdoses are preventing differently, um, what do we do, we share information, and there's this amazing lateral um, trend, um, knowledge dissemination between the group where the clinicians and the professionals come in and work with the peers um, in a very, very respectful, dignified way. And there's not this sort of class structure within the overdose prevention site. Um, we're currently seeing about 131 injections per 10 hours at four booths um, with approximately two to three overdoses, what we call stage three overdoses, um, per 10 hour period. Um, Predominantly now we're intervening with oxygen and we're trying to reduce the amount of naloxone used because 
Of course, we find an overuse of usage of naloxone often puts people uh, into stages of withdrawal, which puts them at risk of having to go out, you know, commit more crime, and um, and then use again and overdose perhaps somewhere else and not survive. I'll pass it off to Megan now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Coco. Um, that's very inspiring. I always love hearing you talk. Um, so I'm going to get back a little bit into the clinical basics, but I just really wanted us to have that framing, and I'm really grateful to the Portland to, um, for sharing their expertise. Um, in terms of uh, now what, what can nurses do, I'm going to go through a few reminders that I'm sure many of you uh, know already and hopefully are, are things that we've all learned in nursing school, but just want to kind of share some of the ways we talk about it, partly also so um, you can use these slides um, if you are starting to do some peer teaching as well. Um, so I often start out by describe, um, just setting the stage that opioids are a class of drugs that include both illicit drugs as well as pain relievers available legally by prescription. These drugs are all chemically related and they act by attaching to a specific protein called opioid receptors, which are found on nerve cells in the brain, spinal cord, gastrointestinal tract, and other organs in the body. Um, and uh, people can get these by prescription and they can also buy them on the market. So there's often a lot of confusion um, between the opioid sort of painkiller um, epidemic that we hear a lot of talk about, but also um, things like heroin, which can both, both be illicit and illicit drug. Um, we actually have a, a heroin um, prescription heroin treatment program called Crosstown in Vancouver, which is, which is um, heroin that's made by a pharmaceutical company in uh, Switzerland. So even heroin is not strictly just an illicit drug. You can see there's a spectrum from natural opioids to semi-synthetics, and then synthetics with morphine-like actions such as codeine and hydromorphone. And then we also um, will be talking about buprenorphine in the uh, <laughs> next session coming up in April with Cheyenne. So she's going to be discussing opioid agonist treatment in great detail as a critical strategy in overdose prevention but not something I'll get too much detail into today because Cheyenne is really going to tackle that in April. Um, fentanyl is kind of the big buzzword that everyone's uh, talking about now, um, and we're seeing actually a lot of moral panic around fentanyl. It really is just another drug, but unfortunately it's a very strong drug um, that's up to 100 times more potent than morphine. We uh, t clinically typically use it to manage severe pain, such as cancer pain, or for folks who might uh, not be opioid naive and who require a really strong opioid to, for breakthrough pain. Um, the current overdose emergency that we're seeing in British Columbia is really related not so much to prescription um, fentanyl that's been diverted, but actually to illicit fentanyl or analogs such as carfentanyl. And this is um, really being produced in illicit uh, labs, and so originally it was sold um, to the community as heroin, sort of a fake heroin, and they were told they were buying heroin, but, it, but when we did a lot of testing, um, found that in fact it was uh, they were unaware that they were um, purchasing something with fentanyl. It's much cheaper for the um, organized crime that currently run the drug scene in Canada um, than uh, transporting um, uh, heroin. Uh, it's got no quality control. It's unknown content. It's I mean, we often describe it as poison circulating in the streets of the downtown east side, um, and people have a really high risk of overdose. Um, something you might have seen in the news occasionally is people overdosing on stimulants in British Columbia. We had a number of um, youth, you know, seven youth in one night in a small suburb, suburban town who thought they were buying cocaine, but it was tainted with fentanyl. Um, we've also seen that at a recent wedding in British Columbia, a large number of wedding guests thought they were buying stimulants, and um, luckily uh, the overdoses were fatal, but there was a sort of mass, I believe, upwards of 20 people overdosed. And this isn't because... Um, dealers are trying to, you know, sneak in uh, opioids or fentanyl. We just think it's probably a contamination issue in the lab where, again, because these are not from a pharmaceutical company, it literally is, you know, people cutting up drugs in uh, non-sterile settings where there can be cross-contamination. Um, one of my colleagues recently gave the analogy, it's kind of like if we were treating diabetics and the health angels were in charge of the insulin, and that's kind of how we're starting to think about this problem in British Columbia, and, and we're desperately asking for other tools like prescription heroin programs, um, such as Crosstown, to be expanded. It's something that's well established in the literature, there's Cochrane Review supporting it, and it's something that we see in um, great success in Europe. And I would be remiss to not mention that uh, 
uh, about fentanyl. I think as nurses, it's great for us to be educated and not um, engage in, in some of the hysteria we're seeing in the public around this particular drug uh, and to really be, be able to communicate um, to folks that the real drivers of this overdose epidemic are structural, their poverty, their housing, that really we could be having this issue with anything and that until we have a regulated um, drug market, it's going to be hard to, to get ahead of this. Um, one of my colleagues has put, uh, pulled this slide from the um, New England Journal of Medicine, and you can see it on how well, you can see it on your screen. But you can see fentanyl in the blue there um, has a very short uh, therapeutic dose, which is one of the reasons that it's quite, got quite a high overdose risk. Um, and I'll talk about naloxone half life coming up. Why are some people more at risk of overdose than others? Um, it's not just because of the substance they're using. It's not just because of fentanyl. Um, so the substance is important, which type of, of, of substance I mentioned here, the, um, the potency, the quality. Um, of course, if you're using a higher, higher quantity of something, the challenge with, with the illicit market is that it's really hard for people who use drugs to know um, how, you know how much they're using. We often teach people to taste their dose, to sort of, which really means to just try a little bit first and see how strong it is before doing a full injection. That's a strategy we'd recommend. Um, it's also, it can depend on people's individual characteristics. So have they recently been ill? Um, are they a senior? Um, have they recently um, had an experience where they were in jail um, or uh, a detox facility so their tolerance is lower? Um, and those are really the people we see who are most at risk for an overdose. Do they have um, any other drugs on board, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, antidepressants? When I was a nurse at, uh, at Naomi, the precursor to the heroin, which was a heroin prescription clinical trial, um, it was really the folks who were drinking that we saw um, have an overdose, and we, we actually used to breathalyze people just so we had a sense of what was going to happen. And if someone had any alcohol on board, um, we'd have to sort of support them to sober up a bit before they could have their dose. Um, and if they had a little bit, um, we'd really we'd get the oxygen card out and really be sort of quite close to them because it, it was the alcohol that we found had one of the biggest impacts. You know, it's, it's another depressant. Um, another criteria that we use for giving um, naloxone for folks if they live in a remote setting and they might have difficulty accessing medical care or they might be likely to use alone. Um, we also uh, know that if someone's injecting, they're at clearly a higher overdose risk. Um, the next slide just kind of hammers this home with some other examples. And I'd be remiss not to mention um, women postpartum. So in my practice at Chiway as a nurse working with women who use drugs, um, you know, after their blood volume's gone down, after they've had their baby, they might have had a period of um, stability for some time during their pregnancy. And then, just like many people, I remember I have two children, and one of the first things I wanted to do after I had my child was have a glass of wine that I couldn't, hadn't been able to enjoy, and that can sometimes happen um, to women who've used drugs for a long time. And so it's, it's important to have those dialogues with them in an open way and say, oh, you know, after baby comes, if you do find you use again, um, just remember your dose will have to be much, much smaller, and um, we actually give, really encourage people to give uh, naloxone to folks after they've leaving, especially in, in high-risk um, prenatal programs. We've also found um, <laughs> clinically that, that women who have had their children removed are at an extremely high um, risk for overdose. And this is also the same in terms of, uh, I've mentioned already, um, people leaving treatment for corrections facilities, but people leaving detox and treatment. It can sound counterintuitive. You know, you, you sound like you're setting them up for failure to discuss with someone leaving a detox facility about their overdose risk, but that's actually um, one of their highest risks for overdose death because people just are not used to realizing that they don't need the same, same dose that they had previously used. In, in detox, what I say clinically to folks is just, Hey, I'm, you know, addiction is a complex, chronic, relapsing disease. You're doing so great right now. Um, um, I'm going to give you this naloxone kit, and I'm going to teach you how to do it. Hopefully, you can use it if you're ever somewhere with a friend or a family member that overdoses. If someone needs to use it on you, but just kind of giving them the positives, but also kind of framing it as something they might use for a friend if, if you think that'll um, be dispiriting for them or just 
just also giving them permission to know that if, if something um, doesn't go according to plan, they can always come back to you as a nurse and not feel ashamed that they might have relapsed. I also always ask my clients if they've overdosed before. Well, it's a new thing with this overdose crisis, but it's amazing the conversations that opens up. I find um, just asking them if they've ever overdosed or witnessed an overdose, and we know those folks are at really high risk, and that conversation um, often leads to some good chats about how maybe they didn't call 911 last time or they didn't know what to do, and we can get, get through some of the strategies I'll be describing next. Um, I also talk about um, with folks really how opioids work and how naloxone works. And so we know that um, the brain has many, many receptors for opioids and an overdose occurs when too much of an opioid such as heroin or oxycodone really attaches to those opioid um, receptors and slows down breathing. Now, naloxone is a, a great um, drug to give because it has a strong affinity to the opioid receptors and the opioids such as heroin, and it essentially knocks the opioids off the receptors for a short time, allowing the person to breathe again and reverse the overdose. Um, sorry, there's an email coming through. I don't know if you can hear that beeping. So it knocks the opioids off the receptor. Again, this is only for 30 to 90 minutes. I'll show you another slide about why that's so important. but. Um, we have a saying in, in British Columbia, naloxone gives life. It can really reverse an overdose. One of the big concerns, though, is because it's got such a short half-life, an overdose can return, and the person can stop breathing again. And so we spend a lot of time trying to um, explain to folks, they're trying to get them to not leave, because often the first thing they want to do, because the, the naloxone can sort of you know, in kick them into withdrawal, essentially, which is quite painful. And then they want to, A, go out and use again. Even if they don't end up using again, just on their own, they can overdose again. So it's, it's really critical if you can try and get the patient to stay with you and be really kind and um, get them into a comfortable place. And you can see here that the naloxone half-life is in, in the blue there, <clears throat> so much, much shorter than um, heroin, morphine, codeine, and in particular uh, methadone. Um, one of the things that we uh, also try and oh, sorry, I'm just back to that. Try and uh, have a lot of empathy for is is if someone does need to go out and use again, we ask them to kind of come back and use with us, just so that we can keep a close eye on them. Um, next slide here, just briefly, I'll mention. Of course, there's also um, non-opioid overdoses. Although opioids are the focus of our talk today, um, a stimulant overdose. Uh, you can see by fast pulse, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, chest pain, often their body's hot. Um, they can be quite agitated, confused, have hallucinations, be unconscious. The treatment for uh, stimulant overdoses really is, uh, if you can, a transfer to a hospital because most of the care is, is at the hospital level um, and they may be, giving, may be given benzodiazepines, for instance. They may have, need cardiac care around uh, arrhythmias. And the pre-hospital care is just sort of basic first aid. I think at the nursing scope of practice, managing any seizures, uh, managing an airway, um, and trauma. In terms of non-opioid depressants, one of the key messages for folks is uh, it can look much like an overdo opioid overdose, and naloxone won't help, but it won't hurt. So it's, it's quite a safe uh, drug, and it's, it's even if someone's having stimulant overdose, it, it doesn't hurt. And that's one of the reasons it's been taken off of um, the federal prescription drug list. So it does not require a prescription. This occasionally um, does not, uh, has not filtered through to the provincial level or to your employer's policies and procedures. I found as a nurse, I'm often doing a lot of ad advocacy, you know, sharing with my employer, my colleagues, um, just the link from the Health Canada website announcing that it's a delisted drug that no longer requires a prescription. And I'm not sure, I'd love to hear from folks what's happening in their um, uh, region, but sometimes you do have to do a bit of advocacy if you're wanting to be able to use it. Um, it's even been delisted within hospitals in British Columbia anyway, but I know that's a national, um, coming nationally. In terms of how do you respond to an opioid overdose, um, I'm going to mainly assume that most registered nurses already know uh, we have our CPR and we know how to use a bag valve mask, et cetera. So I'm going to be sort of sharing these slides with you, uh, hoping that these are useful if you are able to do some take-home naloxone teaching with clients 
Um, and we've also got a ton more slides and a ton more resources for teaching on Towards the Heart, which is um, on the web link number three. So just under, you can see PHS Community Services and then Towards the Heart, and that's BCCDC and regional health authorities have partnered to share all of our resources that we use for overdose prevention. So in terms of um, if you're integrating take-home naloxone into your nursing practice, the steps as a nurse really are to identify clients who are at risk for overdose and screen them, educate them about how to respond to an overdose, dispense if you're able, or refer to a pharmacy where they can dispense, and then to track um, really what's happening in your community. Um, I'd screen participants, just as I talked about those high-risk uh, reasons for overdose earlier. So have they witnessed an overdose? Have they ever survived an overdose? often might open the conversation just by saying, hey, have you been following the news? Did you, did you hear this big overdose crisis in Canada? I'm wondering if you've ever seen an overdose. Have you ever overdosed? And, and people are often like happy to talk about it. And um, it's, it's a near-death experience, so they're, it's quite traumatic for them. Um, I talk about the availability of naloxone in my community. It's different in every uh, region, but I might uh, I definitely would encourage you to familiar yourself with where people can get naloxone, whether it's local pharmacy or harm reduction programs, refer them to the program or dispense, and then discuss what to do when someone's overdosing. And this is something I strongly encourage you if you work in, in a treatment program at all or in a substance use facility to really integrate into all of your um, uh, programs. In terms of uh, key features of an overdose, I start by asking them, hey, do you know what an overdose, opioid overdose looks like? Um, I let, always let the client tell me what they think first, and then I might correct or add any information. The key features are that someone's unresponsive, has slow breathing, or has stopped breathing. Um, they might also have small pupils, snoring or gurgling. They look for blue lips, fingernails, cold, clammy skin. Um, people can have a slow heartbeat. Uh, trouble walking or talking, and this is um, something that can, can sometimes be shrugged off if people are partying, so it's good to sort of encourage folks to look for this. Um, I had one client that very sadly um, woke up with her partner and, like, the love of her life. She was only 19. They'd been together since they were 14, and he was, you know, asleep, she thought, in bed with her, and, and in the morning he was completely blue and cold and had passed away many hours earlier, and that was you know, incredibly traumatic for her. And something she talks about in, in some of her, she now does peer work, says, you know, if I had known the signs of an overdose, I now realize he was overdosing, you know, when we went to bed. But she just thought he needed to sleep it off. So you can have a really big impact just in talking about this with your clients. Um, another big thing we're trying to hammer home here is rescue breathing. So it's a crucial part of the response to an opioid overdose. And if a person has a pulse, um, you don't need to do compressions, of course, but if they don't, then you just go right into your normal CPR. Uh, failing to provide breaths really increases the risk of brain injury from lack of oxygen. So I'll go into how we train people to do that, but it's, it's I, I would say we're sort of failing right now in British Columbia because the focus is so much on naloxone that we see people giving naloxone, and after you give a shot of naloxone, you should wait three to five minutes for it to work, but people are so panicked that they're kind of giving another one right away, which really precipitates quite a painful withdrawal for folks. And it, it's also, it's not needed, but they're also forgetting to give breaths. And so we, we really are trying to, to, to hammer that home to everyone. And in, in terms of your nursing scope of practice, obviously if you know how to use an airway and back valve mask, um, we'd encourage you to do that. It's, it's a lot easier if you have two folks, but just kick into your standard um, CPR and take over and start breathing for the person. Um, many of our peer sites and facilities have also started to add uh, oxygen, and as Coco mentioned, that, that can actually be uh, really useful, but something that you need to do a bit of training and organizing around. These are the steps that um, this, this graphic is actually in our take-home naloxone kit, and we call it SAVE ME. It stands for Stimulate, Airway, Ventilate, Evaluate, Muscular Injection, and then another Evaluate. And it's a really simple teaching tool to go through the steps to respond to an overdose. So we want to stimulate the person, you know, do, do your sternal rub, try and wake them up, um, get an airway going, ventilate, so breathe one breath every five seconds. Uh, and we ask them to sort of evaluate the situation, uh, give a muscular injection, 
we go through how to do that. So we actually have a practice kit, but if you, if you just really need a, a sample ampule and a needle and just review, mo but most drug users know how to use needles, so it's, they're actually quite comfortable usually when you talk about this. We say um, to give, they can even give the injection through genes or whatever if they need to, but we, we, we highlight really it's not an IV drug, it just needs to go into a muscle, often the leg is one of the popular places. Um, and then we say wait three to five minutes, as I said, before you give the next dose. With fentanyl, we're seeing it's such a strong drug that we need to give sometimes upwards of three doses. Um, so that's been quite a challenge. I see we're getting a bit short on time, so I'm not going to go too much into this complicated BC overdose program slide, but just to say that um, one of the reasons we think we're having such a, an overdose crisis is that there is a huge attention on appropriate prescribing with physicians right now. Uh, many are um, being encouraged by their college and, and others, probably rightfully so, to restrict their prescribing of opioid, prescription opioids. Um, but unfortunately, this is for people with chronic uh, substance use issues, it's forcing them into the illicit market where they're having to buy this tainted toxic supply. So we're, we're seeing this collision course between preventing um, new addiction, which is the goal of really restricting prescribing, and that's not really working very well for folks who have a chronic long-term addiction. So um, I think this is, this is something as nurses we have a lot of um, a role to play in terms of advocacy and, and really working with our clients to get engaged into um, uh, ideally a treatment provider that has experience treating addiction and that can help folks get onto a, a substitution therapy that's right for them, whether that's prescription heroin or suboxone or methadone. Um, you know, there's, there's hopefully should be a spectrum. And we think nursing has a strong voice to play in that. Uh, some strategies that you can integrate into your own clinical practice, and many of these I'd, I'd really hammer home, are totally doable and free. So just integrating overdose prevention messages, as I mentioned, into your, into your practice, asking those questions, hey, have you ever seen an overdose before? Have you ever overdosed? Um, what did you do? Tell me a bit about it. Do you know what to do next? Developing a policy for responding to on-site overdoses. Um, it, if people aren't sure what they're allowed to do at your clinic or at your hospital, then sometimes people freeze up. You want to, you want all the staff trained because um, it can really be a matter of life or death if someone's far away from from the nurse and you know the other staff aren't trained in, in a basic first aid that includes overdose response. You want to um, ideally be able to ta offer take-home naloxone or at least be able to refer to it. Um, offering supervised consumption services, Coco showed you that picture of a supervised um, consumption facility that really was just, if you noticed, it's just a table and a chair. It's four tables and four chairs in her case, but it doesn't have to be a $4 million facility like Insight. It can be so, so simple. Um, and Dr. Peter Center, um, if you have heard, haven't heard of that place, really was an interesting model where the nurses there were operating without a Section 56 exemption for many years um, and just saying, this is part of our nursing practice. We work with people who use drugs. Um, the college backed them up. There's some great articles about that at the in the web links. Um, CNA really has been an excellent advocate for us on harm reduction. I encourage you, if you want to do some advocacy in your region, to look at the, the resources CNA has there for you um, and to really work with your, your professional practice leads and physician colleagues and others to, to see if this is something you might be able to integrate. Uh, I've mentioned already the importance of injectable hero or heroin-assisted treatment. Didn't mention hydromorphone. Um, this is often uh, something that's already available, already uh, licensed. You need special access for heroin, um, the special access program of Health Canada. But right now, you could actually start prescribing injectable hydromorphone, and some of our physicians in BC are doing that in primary care, um, and something there's evidence for from the Salome trial. Um, training volunteers and staff on how to respond to overdose is crucial. Having access to opioid agonist therapy like methadone and suboxone that Shine will talk about uh, in a few weeks. And then having overdose follow-up and stabilization. This is a newer project for us in BC, but we're actually starting to um, intervene in the emergency room with folks who've had an overdose and then referring them for a follow-up, whether it's through peer navigation or public health nurses checking in, hey, we know you had an overdose. Um, 
can we help you? What, where are you staying tonight? What's your plans? And, and really the housing. I, I actually think housing, if you could do one thing, would be getting someone shelter. So if someone dies alone um, in, the, in the alley and is sleeping in the alley, it's really hard to intervene. And then uh, Bernie Pauly is going to be talking a lot about trauma-informed and culturally safe care in her upcoming webinar on creating safe spaces for drug users. I just have a couple more slides here. Um, developing an Overdose response plan on Towards the Heart, there's an awesome checklist and plug uh, that Vancouver Coastal Health developed with Fraser Health and BCCDC. And it's just all about, you know, how you can get an overdose response plan going in either at supported housing or your clinic. Um, something that's often missed is outreach staff aren't sure if they're allowed to intervene um, on an overdose. If they see one in the street, they might not necessarily have naloxone in their bags. That's something to make sure they that's available. And does, does the agency have CPR training for everybody? Um, and if you haven't have had an overdose in your agency, have you actually sort of done a, done a debrief as a team and seen what, what worked and what didn't? Another big risk area is bathrooms. And so uh, we know that people often, we've had a number of deaths in British Columbia. Recently, a 16-year-old passed away in a Starbucks bathroom. So bathrooms are really high-risk areas and where people often go to inject. And it's, it's not a good strategy to ban them from the bathrooms um, or to, to create sort of a surveillance system. But we often will just sort of knock on bathrooms, hey, buddy, how are you? How's it going in there? But really the best strategy is to get them not using in the bathroom, so creating safe spaces like a table and a chair to say, um, if you don't have a Section 50 exemption, but hey, if you're going to use use here or keep the bathroom door open so I can check on you, and just starting to have those dialogues with folks. Um, if you make a big rule saying no using in the bathroom, then people will try and hide it, and it actually is more dangerous. Um, just a quick uh, statistic on our Take Home Naloxone program in BC that is um, operated by Dr. Jane Buxton and, and her team at the Center for Disease Control have reversed uh, 5,483 overdoses, which is really remarkable. And this is peers and family members, not necessarily nurses. So um, they've really done a phenomenal job. That's really, you know, almost six thousand lives saved. Uh, one of the things, sorry, I should just quickly plug at the top, you can see only 57%, uh, so just over half, called 911. And that's something we'd like to change and something I also talk with my um, clients with is the first step should be calling 911 and um, that's that's often missed um, and we also encourage people that they won't get in trouble they won't get arrested if they call 911 um, there's good Samaritan protection for them and if that's not happening in your community and the police are arresting drug users health and nursing has a great opportunity to meet with police and say hey this is actually um, causing more deaths and sometimes you need to have have those meetings and do that advocacy. I'm just going to finish up by just asking folks to reflect on, on what strategies you might be able to implement. I hope I hope we gave you some free, um, easy things to integrate into your practice, and then some strategies that, that might require some further advocacy. Um, and the web links I've already mentioned are down below for you to click on. Um, and we just want to thank all of our colleagues who have shared some of their slides um, that are listed here, and, and of course the residents and, and our community members who work with us. Um, and towards the heart, which is um, really doing a lot of excellent work here. And now I'm going to hand it over to Carrie. Great. Thank you so much, Megan and Coca. So um, I just wanted to mention uh, at CNA House here, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, so I can't see our screen. So Megan and Coco, I might ask if you can advance the slides um, for us. Um, so the, the slide right now um, would just be talking about typing in your questions. So if you haven't already, please type them in the Q&A box. I have um, quite a number of questions we've collected already, so we'll, we'll do our best to get through um, the ones that we have. Um, and then if you're able just to uh, advance to the next slide. Um, and just for more information, uh, we have Megan and Coco's contact information and mine as well. And I just really want to take this opportunity um, to, to thank our presenters um, and, and just before we get into our questions. So um, I, I'm not sure, Megan or Coco, who would prefer to answer this, but um, is there uh, a suggested administrative protocol occupational health nurses use for non-healthcare settings? 
And if so, um, can a copy be provided, or is there something you can recommend? Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure exactly which setting they mean, but if you're talking about um, protocols for administering the lock zone, for instance, or overdose response protocols, there are definitely some on the BCCDC website. Um, I'm not sure if DNA or if there's a na I'm not aware of a national one, but um, certainly folks are welcome to adapt the BC one. We've got one for peers, and we've got one for um, nurses as well. And so Towards the Heart's a great resource for that. It's at the top. Um, there's a whole manual on implementing harm reduction um, in non-clinical settings on there. There's also a whole manual on um, implementing naloxone programs. And then in terms of occupational health and safety um, at the overdose prevention sites, both which are in supervised conception sites, there's also a couple manuals available there on that. And, and that includes sort of preventing you know, needle sticks and such. And we've adapted a number of um, the Portland Hotel Society's uh, protocols and such from there. I don't know if yours are posted anywhere, Coco. They're not, but um, we have many um, sort of handbooks um, on best practices and OHNS and the overdose prevention sites. Um, you can email me at coco at phs.ca, and I'd be happy to share any information we have on, on, on those things. Great, thank you. And we also have uh, similarly a question about from someone who works in home care, just wondering um, if there are um, protocols for registered nurses to use in a home care setting. Um, I'm not sure if the, the ones that you mentioned are adaptable to that setting, Megan and Coco. I think the one um, the one for nurses, which is actually a, it's, it's written originally as a DST, so a decision support tool for registered nurses, and it includes public health nursing, home care, outreach nurses, really anyone outside the hospital setting. And we wrote it before naloxone was delicensed. So we're actually, uh, my colleague Cheryl Prescott, I think, is, um, was just sharing with me, she's going to be revising it to make it, because we don't require a prescription anymore. But it actually might be quite useful for some of the um, settings where people haven't quite sorted that out yet with their employers. So yeah, please do. Um, we have a philosophy of um, sharing and st stealing and borrowing shamelessly, um, which is a big quality improvement principle these days, and um, give full permission to uh, adapt those and use them as you like. And if you can't find them on uh, BCCDC's website or Towards the Heart, you are well welcome to email me, but they're definitely up there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I know that some um, strategies to decrease stigma were just um, discussed in the presentation, but we do have a question about what recommendations do you have to assist nurses to decrease stigmatizing um, people who use substances? So I don't know if you're if you can just kind of summarize them for our audience. That would be helpful. Well, I think the strategy is that um, your nursing staff and your teams have to be um, well informed and have a, a deep and systemic understanding of the population and the barriers that they face. Um, so not just theoretically, but they have to have they have to understand the populations that they serve, and then again, knowledge dissemination around sharing um, ways to meaningfully engage with the community that you're engaging with, and also. I think one of the most um, important things you can do is hold a focus group or have that dialogue with the population you're trying to engage and ask them what they need from you. How can you serve them better? What can they recommend? What are they? What is their experience like? And not just let you know them not just producing um, an instruction page um, in your operations manual, but actually um, operationalizing that as part of the way you um, train your your staff and the way you operate yourself. Thank you. And thanks for that. I might just add to um, <laughs> nurses love instruction manuals. I do. Yeah. No, no, no. I love. I love uh, it goes, those. Also freedom. But if you're new to this practice, um, I, I can try and add a link to it. But there's a PHSA has a trauma informed practice um, toolkit, and it's about how to integrate trauma informed practice into your setting, which includes a lot of stigma reduction, um, and that's a really cool toolkit. Hopefully, Bernie will talk about it in her presentation next month. Um, but it's actually got a checklist about, you know, just and it's really simple things like um, not having people wait outside in the cold in the line when they're waiting for their methadone programs and um, having peers engaged and training you know, your front desk staff to um, just be really kind to everyone and not be worried when people miss their appointments. And so that's helpful. And I think another way nurses can get engaged in stigma reduction is we are one of the most trusted professions in Canada are often on the you know, top five list, if not the top list. And when nurses speak up in media, when we phone into 
you know, CBC radio call-in shows, when we write letters to the editor, it has a lot of weight behind it, and I encourage all of us to do that. And when you see stigmatizing comments about people who use drugs, um, you know, language like junkies and addicts and these are throwaway people, um, speak up and uh, learn about what learn about language, learn about how people want to be referred to in your community. It's different everywhere. Um, uh, users groups are often so happy to be engaged with nurses and, and many communities actually have, you know, whether it's a methadone support group or a, um, a group of drug users sort of struggling and, and when nurses can give some of our, our power and our um, uh, le uh, legitimacy as professionals, if we can help in ally work, it's it's incredibly helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Um, if my community is not supportive of harm reduction strategies, where do I start? That's, that's a great question. Um, where to start? I think I, I mentioned just in your own practice, um, Coco used the term radical kindness, and just really understanding where uh, drug users are coming from is, is huge and can have such an impact on people. Um, it's, it takes a lot of self-work. Um, in the Realm of Hungry Growth is a great book that uh, Gabor Mate wrote that Coco referenced. It's a good one to, to start with. If you're already really versed in harm reduction and you're trying to bring people along, um, bringing together diverse allies is great. So having um, mothers who use drugs, um, or sorry, not mothers who use drugs, mothers who have lost children to overdose, that's a very powerful um, ally group to work with, to have um, drug users at the table, to have physician colleagues, um, you know, maybe just host a Q&A session and, and start to talk about the overdose burden in your particular city or talk about what's going on nationally um, and just start to, you know, it, it happens kind of church basement by church basement, but that's really how, how we built the movement here, you know, what Coco had. I would just like to add that um, additionally, harm reduction is an evidence-based practice. So there's an enormous amount of resources online that will, um, you know, that make the case for harm reduction as an intervention um, in the, in not only just the opioid <laughs> crisis, but in engaging with drug users safely and reducing harm. Um, and again, if you want to contact either Megan or myself or look online, there are many resources that we can direct you toward um, that will give you just some, again, like some context and some evidence-based numbers and outcomes um, that uh, speak speak truth about um, harm reduction as an intervention. Thank you. So we're running just slightly over time, but due to the number of participants and robust nature of the discussion, I'll just ask one more question, um, and that would be, what public policy do you believe is needed around legalization of drug use and safe drug use sites? Not an easy question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great, a great big question. I mean, personally, I think that um, the war on drugs is responsible for a lot of these deaths, and it's it's it can sound radical, but that's been that's a sort of direct quote from Kofi Annan at the United Nations and many others. So, if you're looking for um, resources on um, drug regulation and decriminalization, I mean, you can actually go literally to the United Nations for some of the most um, robust discussions on this. But it also points to the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. Our colleague Donald McPherson has a national um, group that's just got some excellent resources about talking about this and you know, top five uh, points around what, how, to, how to help in terms of policy change with the overdose response. We are um, really pleased to see the, the um, changes within the federal government recently and, and the changes to the supervised consumption site, uh, previously very restrictive legislation, so that the new Bill C-37 coming through um, and CNA is providing some great leadership on, on that as well and, and suggesting some amendments. So I think we're, we're looking forward to um, change, but it, it is happening slowly. And I think nurses um, have a huge opportunity to influence this. So encourage anyone that's not already um, involved to get involved and um, to bring your voice to the table. Great. <laughs> Thank you again to Megan and Coco for the presentation on opioid overdose prevention basics for nurses, and thank you as well for 
your continued advocacy and the work that you do. Um, thanks to the participants. We hope that this session has stimulated your thinking about uh, nursing practice and how you can take some of what you've learned today um, into your practice. Um, if someone's able to advance the slide, that would be fantastic. So our next slide um, just talks about, if you haven't already, please consider registering for the next webinar in the series. Um, Megan's alluded to it um, several times. The next one is an evidence-based review of opioid agonist treatments and what they mean for nursing practice. And the English uh, version of this webinar will be held on Tuesday, April 4th, 2017, from 12 to 1 Eastern time. So thank you again, everyone. If you wouldn't mind advancing, we just have our last thank you slide. And We'll sign off from here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.